Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at and with Trinity Lutheran Church, a Reconciling in Christ congregation that welcomes all of God's children with all of their diverse gifts and experiences to form a community of faith that works for racial equity and economic justice, one that honors the full spectrum of gender, gender identity, and sexual orientation. If you're watching our live stream, you are invited to receive the Sacrament of Holy Communion when you see it received here in the sanctuary. Everyone in the sanctuary is welcome to receive communion today. You don't need to be a member of this church or of any church in order to come to God's table. You can stay in your places when it's time to receive communion, you just need one of those white paper bags that contains a little kit that you will use. Those who want to come forward for communion will come up the middle aisle and either take a communion kit from that little table or receive a piece of bread from me, which they will then dip into wine or juice before consuming. If you want to have someone mentioned in this morning's prayers, please go to the table at the back of the center aisle and write their name on one of the post-it notes there. Those notes will be collected before we offer today's prayers of the people. There are a few ways to tell us you're here for worship today. We have laptops or tablets out there where you can check in electronically. You can also aim your smartphone at the QR code on one of the last pages of the bulletin. Both of these methods allow you to request regular emails from the church about our activities and events. Today is the first Sunday in the church season of Lent. And point, little point of trivia, the church separates the Sundays from the rest of Lent. And when you count the 40 days of the season, you don't count the Sundays. A key aspect of Lent is taking on some disciplines that draw us closer to God, whether they be prayer, the reading of the Bible, or acts of service. We're offering daily devotions for Lent that are drawn from a book called the 1619 Project. We're distributing the devotions by email and posting links to them on our website and our Facebook page. Every Wednesday, even in Lent, a group from the congregation gathers for breakfast at nine o'clock at the Copper Kitchen on Central Avenue at 56th Street South. On Wednesdays at 11.30, we offer a hot lunch to the community a few blocks south of here at Christ Methodist Church. Talk to Jerry if you wanna help with that ministry. We have a class on prayer that meets over Zoom on Wednesdays at three o'clock. This Wednesday at 6.30, we're starting a series of in-person gatherings for study and fellowship bring some food or drink to share, and then watch and discuss short videos about the Bible and archeology. span Our food pantry is open on Friday mornings. We need volunteers there at nine. Talk to Lynn if you can help with that ministry. This Saturday, is it really this Saturday? Okay, this Saturday, starting at nine in the morning, the church council and the church staff are meeting to set a vision for the life of this congregation and a vision in particular for what the rest of 2023 is going to look like. And we would love, I, I would love to have members of the congregation join us for the first part of the day in the morning to talk about things like, why has God put this congregation in this city at this particular time? So if that is a conversation you would be interested in joining in, be on the lookout for an email from me this week about our Saturday council staff visioning day. All right, this next one is important. Everyone listen. Starting on Sunday, March 12th, our Sunday worship will begin at 11 in the morning and not at 10. For the next few weeks or months, we'll be worshiping at 11 in the morning and not at 10. Have I mentioned what time service starts on March the 12th? 
Rest assured, the church staff will be working on changing the sign outside, changing the website, changing our Facebook page. But you all know that on Sunday, March 12th, Sunday worship will begin at... My work is done. Are there any other announcements that need to be made this morning? Next Sunday is still the same time, Brendan wants you to remember. What time is worship on Sunday, March 5th? What time is worship on Sunday, March 19th? Good. This congregation, in all of its glory, cannot exist without the generous financial gifts of our worshipers. There is an offering plate out in the narthex, the entrance area of the church, where you can put a contribution there's also a QR code in the middle of your bulletin that you can use to make a donation on our website. This week, get in here. <laughs> this week, we get to wish a happy birthday to Alan Dew. Is there anybody else here today who is celebrating a birthday or an anniversary this week? Then we get to humiliate him all by himself. <laughs> you to silence any electronic devices you brought with you today and quiet your heart and your mind and get ready for a time of worship. and sustains us with the gift of grace. Amen. Let us acknowledge before God and one another our need for repentance and for God's mercy. Holy Father, we confess to you our faults and fails. Too often we neglect and do not trust your holy word. We hold for ourselves instead of giving to others. We spoil rather than steward your creation. We choose fear or compassion. Forgive us, remind us, and lead us as we seek to follow in your way. Hear the good news. God so loved the world that God gave the only Son so that all may receive life. This promise is for you. God embraces you with divine mercy, forgives you in Christ's name, and revives you in the Spirit power. Amen. <laughs>
Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. the Bible often makes use of symbols and metaphors that for centuries were seen as historical facts. For example, the book of Genesis offers us the story of two human creatures living and working in God's garden and of what happened when they encounter a talking serpent who stirs up doubt about God in their hearts. Psalm 32 describes how guilt and shame have the power to kill us, and how God's forgiveness restores us to life. The letter to the Romans blames Adam for all of the world's sin and for the existence of death in the world. It compares the sin of Adam with the righteousness of Jesus. The Gospel of Matthew presents the devil as someone who can test Jesus's understanding of his own identity. Let us pray. Lord God, our strength, the struggle between good and evil rages within and around us and the devil, and all the forces that defy you, tempt us with empty promises. Keep us steadfast in your word, and when we fall, raise us again and restore us, through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. The first reading is from Genesis. The Lord took the man and put him in the garden, thank you, to till it and keep it. And the Lord God commanded the man, you may eat freely of every tree in the garden, 
but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall die. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other wild animal that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God say you shall not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat the fruit of the tree that is in the middle of the garden, nor shall you touch it, for you shall die. But the serpent said to the woman, You will not die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made loincloths for themselves.
The second reading is from Paul's letter to the Romans. Just as sin came into the world through one man, and death came through sin, and so death spread to all because all have sinned. Sin was indeed in the world before the law, but sin is not reckoned when there is no law. Yet death exercised dominion from Adam to Moses, even over those whose sins were not like the transgression of Adam, who is a type of the one who was to come. But the free gift is not like the trespass. For if the many have died through the one man's trespass, much more surely have the grace of God and the free gift in the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded for the many. And the free gift is not like the effect of one man's sin, for the judgment following one trespass brought condemnation, but the free gift following many trespasses brings justification. If because of one man's trespass, death exercised dominion through that one, much more surely will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness exercise dominion in the life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Therefore, just as one man's trespass led to condemnation for all, so one man's act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all. For just as by the one man's disobedience, the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience, the many will be made righteous. Word of God, word of life. Thank you. said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, One does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and placed him on the pinnacle of the temple saying to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command His angels concerning you, and on their hands they will bear you up, so that you will not dash your foot against a stone. Jesus said to him, Again it is written, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. Again, the devil took him to a very high mountain 
and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their splendor. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Jesus said to him, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve only him. Then the devil left him, and suddenly angels came and waited on him. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, o Christ. Please be seated. Well, let's be honest. Nowadays, talk of the devil or Satan seems restricted to scary movies. And I really love those movies. I really don't think it matters if we believe in the devil as much as whether we believe in God. Whether or not the devil is real, sin and evil, guilt and shame, violence and hatred, they are very real and they seem to have a will of their own, a will that is opposed to God. The existence of a supernatural opponent to God is taken for granted in most of the Bible. The Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke agree that Jesus was tested by the devil while in the Judean wilderness just after his baptism in the Jordan River. It was at his baptism that he heard God announce his identity as my beloved son. The tests offered by the devil all touch on how Jesus intends to live into that identity. All of us are tested in life by the devil, by the forces of evil in the world, or by our own worst nature. We're tested as we struggle to live into our identity as beloved child of God. Our tests are much like the ones that Jesus faced. Will we take care of ourselves, turning stones into bread, or will we take care of others? Will we demand the attention of those around us? Or will we humbly serve in ways that might not even be noticed? Will the splendor of worldly glory lure us into worshiping the violence, fear, and hatred that are prized by the world? Or will we follow the humble, self-sacrificing, unconditionally loving ways of God. We triumph in our testing, not because we can find a scripture to prove our point, but because we are so immersed in scripture, so immersed in prayer, so immersed in the truth of our identity, that God's values have become our own. The wilderness is not the only place where Jesus will be tested by the words, if you are the Son of God. The very same words will be flung at him while he hangs upon a cross, suffering and dying, in order to completely destroy the power that sin holds over human lives. A power that sin has held for as long as there have been human beings who were blessed with the freedom to choose God's ways or the ways of the world. Some say that the book of Genesis teaches us how sin came into the world. It might be more accurate, though, to say that Genesis tells stories about the origin of human relationships and of their fragility. The stories begin in chapter 2, 
with God forming a creature out of soil and breathing divine life into it, this original human possesses no gender. It is not a man, it is just a human, a blend of the stuff of the earth and the stuff of God. The earth at this time is a pretty lifeless place, but in one spot, God plants a garden and assigns the human creature the job of caring for the garden. God wants the creature to enjoy relationships, so God creates all of the other beasts and birds out of the same soil, each intended as a possible life and work partner for the human. No creature seems ideal to the task, so the language and the grammar of Genesis tell us very specifically that God takes a section or a side of the non-gendered human creature and uses it to craft a person of the female gender. It's only then that the remaining section or side of the original creature is assigned the gender of male. The biblical narrative is not about whether one gender holds superiority over another, or if one is weaker and more susceptible to sin and temptation than the other. The point is that all humans, regardless of where they fall on a very nuanced spectrum of gender, are all one and the same. We're all made of the same stuff. And then, out of nowhere, Genesis just introduces a talking serpent into the story. It doesn't say this serpent is Satan or the devil. Church tradition and works of religious fiction have filled in that detail. Presumably, a talking serpent is just a part of God's good creation, instilled, like us, with the freedom to choose God's ways or reject them. The human creatures have been made so that they can live in relationship with God, with one another, and with everything else in God's garden. And the serpent tries to undermine all of that. The serpent initiates a conversation with the woman while the man is clearly standing right next to her. The man could speak up at any time, but chooses not to. When the serpent asks about God's rules for the garden, the woman reports instructions that are a bit harsher than what God had originally said. The serpent does not tempt the woman. The woman does not seduce the man. The serpent simply presents an alternative set of facts, and the man and the woman make a choice about what to believe. Will they believe that God wants the best for them, and therefore must have a very good reason for banning the consumption of fruit from a single tree within a garden of abundance? Or will they believe that God is keeping something from them, and that they would be better off doing things their own way? Genesis presents sin as a refusal to trust that God speaks the truth. And along with sin comes shame and vulnerability. Sin changes the way we look at ourselves and the world in which we live. But does Genesis say that human sin creates human death? Would humans have possessed immortality if they hadn't succumbed to their own worst instincts? Or is God describing a more symbolic kind of death? The death of trust. The trust of God and our trust in one another. The point of Genesis isn't to assign the blame for human sin. 
Its point is to say how sin spoils all of our relationships. Our relationship with God, our relationship with the people closest to us, our relationship to the planet and all of creation. Then the Bible's story of sin is picked up in Psalm 32. Sin is widespread in the world. All of us have times when we refuse to trust God and insist on trying to take care of ourselves. And in the process, we cause a lot of harm to one another and to God's good creation. We discover that our sinful rebellion is cutting us off from God and from life itself. What are we to do about it? The psalm says our first priority is to repair our broken relationship with God. And all we have to do is speak the truth to God the way God has always spoken the truth to us. As soon as we break our silence, God starts fixing the damage. In the psalm, the stewing over sin goes on for quite a few verses, and God's forgiveness is instantaneous. God doesn't forgive us because we have finally confessed our wrongdoing. God forgives us because God is in the business of loving and forgiving. It's who God is, and it's what God does. Psalm 32 says that God takes away the guilt of our sin. It celebrates the forgiveness that we experience once we confess our sinfulness. It says that if we allow it, God will always teach us and guide us so that we won't go astray and won't need to feel guilt or shame about our bad choices. That is what it meant when the psalm says, mercy embraces those who trust in the Lord. The Bible goes on to tell us that death is somehow a spoiling of God's good creation caused by the sinful rebellion of human beings. Science tells us that death and extinction are an integral part of God's good creation, but I'm pretty sure that human beings are the only creatures who fear death and who try to pretend that it doesn't exist. The Apostle Paul's letter to Christians in Rome places the blame for death and for sin on one human being, and it assigns the male gender to that human being, Paul thinks it's very important if Jesus' gender matches that of Adam. I think it would have been true enough to say that human beings of all genders are stuck in sin, and God in human form takes sin away. In blaming Adam for all human sin, Paul is acknowledging that there is something about sin that connects us to all of humanity throughout time. But there is also something about sin that is deeply personal to each and every one of us. Each of us makes choices about whether we will live into our identity as a child of God. Each of us struggles to live into that identity because of the general human tendency to misuse God's gift of freedom. But through the death and resurrection of Jesus, we have been saved from the power of that sin, that fear, that shame, even the power that death holds over us. We have been rescued and, frankly, removed from a world where sin and death have power and planted right back in God's garden where sin and death have no power over us. And every time the devil tries to tell us that we've let God down, every time the world says we should have more sense than to believe in unconditional love, 
Every time the worst part of our nature tests our commitment to live as a beloved child of God, all we have to do is start a conversation with God and experience again the truth that God forgave our sin a long, long time ago. Amen.
because of how much God loves us. If that's what you believe, then please use the words of the Apostles' Creed to confess them. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and my life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Sustained by God's abundant mercy, let us pray for the church, the world, and all of creation. You alone are God. Sustain us on our wilderness journey. Give us vision and wisdom. Counsel all who faithfully lead your people into the future. Merciful God, Receive our prayer. You create lush gardens and expansive deserts. Teach us to tend to the needs of every living creature and to bless those who work in fields and orchards, that the world may be nourished by the fruits of their labor. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You know our temptations. You accept us as we are. You work tirelessly to free us from anything that keeps us from our full potential as individuals, as communities, and as a nation. Instill in us a sense of your justice and righteousness, that equity and peace will pervade all the regions and nations of the world, especially in the area of Ukraine. Merciful God, receive our prayer. You are a hiding place for all in distress. Inspire us to help exiles and refugees and in times of trouble, trauma, or illness to surround people with your steadfast love. For Ann Gibson, Bill Michael, Norm and Ruth Morgan, Jen Cowan, Barb McComb, Sweet Laura Dave, Carolyn and Tom Jackson, Bonnie and Bianca, Bill and Diane Hinton, Anne the Banker, Lisa and Jason Stark, Brian. Merciful God, you offer abundance to all. Guide our ministries of hospitality that we may share your love with generosity and joy. Merciful God, you alone are God. We praise you for the faithful departed of every age. Unite our prayers with theirs until our wilderness journey is complete and we rest in you. Merciful God, we, our prayer. <clears throat> we lift our prayers to you, O oh God. The prayers we've offered here, the prayers of our hearts, the prayers that we now offer up with our lips. We lift our prayers to you, O oh God, trusting in your love and your promise to renew your creation. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you all. And also you.
Let's share signs of that peace with one another and with the rest of the world.
Our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. Gathered into one body by the power of the Holy Spirit, let us pray the words that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, and we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For our name is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Come and receive Jesus, our strength in life's wilderness. Amen. Please be seated. The others will tell you when to come forward, if that is what you're going to do. If you're going to stay in your places, though, get out that little kit, figure out which side of it holds the bread, and peel back the cover on that side. It is the body of Christ given for you. And then peel back the cover on the other side of the kit. It is the blood of Christ shed for you. And if you're going to come forward for communion, you'll come down the middle aisle and either help yourself to one of these kits or hold out your hands to me and I will place in your hand a little morsel of bread which you will take to Kim or to Teresa they're holding a metal chalice that holds wine and a glass chalice that has juice in it. And you'll dip your bread into either of those. And then you can stay at the altar rail for prayer or just go back to your seat.
embodied God. At your table, we have tasted the goodness of Jesus. With the eyes of our hearts open to your promise, empower us to hear the needs of our neighbors and touch the world with your love. Amen. As it's easy to do so, and if you're able, I invite you to stand to receive God's blessing. God, the giver of life, Christ, the resurrection and the life, and the Holy Spirit of rebirth, bless you this Lenten journey. Amen. Amen. Peace, serve in love, and see God.